Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Ask Katie Anything. I'm your host, licensed marriage and family therapist, Katie Morton. I'm so glad that you're here. In this week's episode, we're gonna discuss feeling like we never, we will never recover and how to get through it. I'll also talk about body checking and how often a therapist should call out a client on it. Then I'll explain why we struggle to have fun and relax in life sometimes and why we can feel stuck in a younger version of ourselves. I will also dive into the effects of being a child of rape and why we can feel angry when therapy is ending. Without further ado, let's jump into those questions. And question number one says, hey Katie, happy Sunday. I suffer from anxiety, depression, and complex PTSD. And if I'm honest with myself, I've never felt like I'm going to recover. I've always felt that one day the things I struggle with will win and I'll end things. I've been struggling a lot lately to do anything that isn't immediately required. For example, working on my dissertation feels impossible, but replying to an email that needs to be answered today is doable, though I still struggle. I know this is probably a depressive episode. I have all the other hallmarks, disturbed sleep, poor appetite, lack of joy in things that used to bring me joy, etc. But this difficulty doing things feels different to normal depression. I realized the other day that I'm just waiting for the end since I don't believe I'm going to survive my struggles. And I think that's why I have trouble doing anything that isn't immediately required. What's the point of working on my dissertation, for example, if I won't be around to need it? I'm going to talk to my psychologist about this realization and see if she has any ideas or how to overcome it. But I was wondering if you had any ideas. Intellectually, I know I need to do these things and the consequences of not doing them won't be pleasant. But knowing all that doesn't make it any easier to actually do them. Thanks for all that you do. Of course. Now... Your suspicions are my suspicions, the depression. And something that maybe I haven't talked about enough are the different kind of layers or levels to depression. Depression come in a lot of different forms and it can feel differently depending upon the trigger. Now, for some of my patients, they have like the same flavor every time. But for a lot of my patients, they don't, especially if you mix in different life stressors and different events. Everything from like having a child, so postpartum depression can be its own feeling, to changing jobs and moving, having like extra stressors can change the presentation or the feeling, maybe the experience of the depression for my patients. So it really just depends. And that's really what I believe is happening here. And the thing about depression slash suicidal thoughts, because it sounds like you have both a lot, is that it, it just removes any potential hope or excitement about the future. And so uh, aside from talking to your psychiatrist, I don't know if you're on medication, but I would encourage you to, to consider it so that we can get you out of this funk, this depressive slump. Um, but I have a couple of ideas of things you can do today to help yourself feel better, okay? And I know motivation, I'm again, I'm not fixing this problem of like, I have trouble doing things that are more long-term related. That's depression talking, that's medication, that's through therapy. So you're gonna talk to your psychologist, that's all gonna be great. I'm talking today to help improve your mood even just slightly, even if we can move it up like 1%, 2%, amazing. When you get up in the morning, I want you to get outside and I want you to get some sun on your face. Now, if you're one of those people that you have to get up and go to work when it's still dark outside, as soon as that sun comes up, I want you near a window or outside in it, basking in its radiance. Now, it's ideal for us to do it first thing in the morning, but anytime during the day, getting some sun on that face helps our body release more dopamine and serotonin, helps us feel good. Let's do that. Also, if we're feeling in a funk and we're feeling really down, I want you to get in the practice or in the habit of either every morning or every night. Morning's kind of better because it almost sets our day up for success a little more. And yes, I know you're depressed and your motivation is low. I'm not forgetting that. Hang in there. But these are just some ideas. In the morning, I want you to write down one thing that you're looking forward to. Could be that day, could be the next day, could be the next week. The farther out you can get, the better, but I'll, I'll settle for like in the next hour, next four hours, next day. That's awesome. Let's start there and start moving it out. What's something you're looking forward to? I don't know if you're like me and you love Thanksgiving. I'm so excited about the holidays. I love the holidays. Maybe you don't. Maybe you like New Year's. Maybe you like the fact that it's quiet. Maybe you love winter. Maybe you're looking forward to summer. I don't know. Just some ideas. Something that you're looking forward to. And then when it comes to breaking through the depression motivation kind of wall, we have to set our sights differently. We have to have smaller goals for a little while until we can get you, like I said, some medication. You're drowning in your symptoms right now. That's what medication is there for. Please talk to a, psycho a psychiatrist. I know you said you'll tell your psychologist about it. 
I hope you have a psychiatrist you're working with. Let's reach out to them, get an appointment ASAP because either our medication is too low or we're not on the right one for us or we need to start a medication or something. Something needs to give because you're drowning in those symptoms. But when it comes to the motivation, we need to keep our goals uh, easily achievable and small. Things like I got out of bed and made it to school on time. I showered. I fed myself. I drank water. I took my medication as prescribed. I emailed that person. We have to do the, ba- I, I made sure I got enough sleep. Even if it's disturbed, were you in bed for at least seven and a half hours? We have to give ourselves a little motivation through the simple basic self-care things because those are probably lacking and it's not making us feel any better so take a minute and write down a couple things you'd like to do every day just a couple maybe two to three max i'll let you go just a few if you want but two to three max of things that you maybe should be doing every day or you feel like you should and you just can't and make those your your main goals And I want them to be things that make you feel better, that take care of you. Things like I said, showering, eating, drinking, taking medication as prescribed, all that. So going for a walk, petting a dog, getting a coffee, I don't know, any of those things, okay? And just hang in there. I mean, I'm trying to think if there's any other ideas, but the reason that you're not wanting to do things that are farther out is because of that depression and it's taken that away. And if you have anything that's worked in the past, because it sounds like this isn't a new struggle. If you've had anything that, I always call it like, It's helped you light the match because depression takes away all the light. It puts us in the darkness. It makes us think it's never going to get better. It's very hopeless, helpless feeling. It's so heavy, right? And it's like we can't even see it's so dark. And if something strikes that match, just gives us that little bit of hope, even for a second before it goes out. What has worked in the past? What has helped keep you um, briefly hopeful about the future? Can we do the more of that? Can we lean into that? Is there some, you know or spend more time with that person or thing. Maybe that's another way to, okay? Hang in there. But I really think medication will help you get your head above water. Now let's move on to question number two. It says, hey Katie, I'm wondering about the frequency that a therapist should be calling a client out for body checking behavior during session. Hmm. When are times you ignore it versus bring it up? I'm currently in eating disorder recovery and we have sessions where there's absolutely nothing said. Hmm. But the other days that are rapid fire, one after um, oh, the other call outs. I'm still very stuck on some of the behaviors and don't realize I'm doing them when I get anxious, but will actively choose to not engage in them when I'm aware that I have the urge to do so. On the days where he points it out tons, I feel like that's all he focuses on, which pipelines um, to the thoughts that he's hypervigilant in my body and my actions, which causes anxiety. I totally get it. It's like a snowball, right? But also the days where he doesn't, I spend the session worrying that he's, um, that he is about to, oh, gotcha, or that I will subconsciously engage in these behaviors and then barely pay attention to the actual session. Let your therapist know what's happening here is not helpful. So the real question about frequency isn't, it's not a question I can answer. It's more about what's therapeutic. And this tons or none is like fucking with your therapy session. It's making it hard for you to pay attention, for you to focus, for you to be present and be able to do it. And so talk to him about it. Because for me, to be honest, I mention it to patients up front, like, hey, I noticed that you're doing some body checking behavior. Um, I will be calling it out. I'll let you know. But I I do it at the end of a session. And then my homework is for them to notice how often they're doing it in their real life, which they never want to be honest about. But that's okay. It's part of the process. Um, I'll call it out in session sometimes when I feel like it's, it's almost the same way I call it anxious behavior where I'm like, you realize you've been shaking your foot for the last 20 minutes, but it's not rapid fire. I don't do it constantly. I don't feel like that's helpful. I feel like that shuts people down. You're like, bah, 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 bah. It's more like, hey, I, I, I use it as a key or as a, not really a key as much as an indicator of something going on, right? If they're doing a lot of body checking or if you're anxious and you're shaking a lot, that means that it you're boop, 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 you're feeling overwhelmed. Your anxiety's up or I'm, I'm triggering something. It's very emotionally charged. I want to draw attention to that so we can help calm back down not pull like make you feel ashamed for it so let your therapist know this is happening because what is happening is not therapeutic or helpful and he shouldn't be bringing it up or not in this way because it's it's preventing you from being able to participate in therapy and so let them know because 
yes, it should be called out because it's not behavior that we want to keep doing, but it shouldn't be getting in the way of us being able to participate, okay? Because it's your therapy time and I want you to be able to benefit from it. And this incessant like uh, feeling judged and looked at and watched is like making it impossible. So let him know, okay? Moving on to question three, it says, hi, Katie. I feel like I don't know how to have fun and just relax. Hmm. I'm so anxious and scared all of the time. And I feel like every day, if not multiple times a day, I hear horrible stories about shootings, killing, disease, wars, fires, car accidents, and so much more that I'm constantly just so scared. And I feel so sad for all the people affected. It is a lot lately. I have to be honest, it's pretty emotionally exhausting. I feel guilty for having minor issues when such bigger things are going on. And I also feel so on edge that at any minute, something bad is going to happen. I stopped watching the news. Good because I couldn't handle it. But it doesn't matter if it keeps coming up in conversations or the news is on the, at the nail salon or the doctor's appointment or it's on Instagram. I know it's everywhere. I don't know what to do or how to cope. I'm so sad that so many people are hurting and I feel so useless that I'm not doing more to help at the same time. I'm starting to get more and more scared to leave the safety of my home. Uh-oh. Thank you for all that you do. Sorry, this was so long. It's okay. No need to apologize. You can take up as much space as you need. Now, let's maybe take a break from... Like I encourage you, obviously nail salon doctor's appointments, we can't help if the news is on there. But I encourage you to grab a magazine instead and read it. And I also encourage you to mute accounts on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, whatever you're on, um, or X, I guess is Twitter, whatever. I'll still call it Twitter. Um, whatever you're on, I encourage you to mute accounts talking about things that are overwhelming. Now people can be mad and be like, you can't, silence is violence. No, this is self-preservation. There's so much hate and upset and death and destruction in the world that it's okay to take a break from it. Yes, I know other people can't and they're living in war-torn countries. I'm not saying that, you know, we, that, that I'm not, I'm not not acknowledging that pain, okay? But because someone else is in pain does not mean that I have to be in constant pain too. It's not happening to me. I can take action where I can to assist, but that doesn't mean we have to continue like bombarding ourselves with messages and images. And it's too much. It's, it's upsetting. It's, it's emotionally dysregulating. It's more than we're supposed to be exposed to. I remember back when I was growing up, like before social media, you would watch the news like 30 minutes at like five or six o'clock. Maybe your parent would catch like the 10 o'clock news or whatever, or 11 o'clock news or whatever, but that was it. There was no other, I guess you could read the newspaper in the morning, but this constant bombardment with people's opinions and uh, different videos and thoughts on things and memes that are being shared that could be helpful or not, like it can get to be a lot and it can feel overwhelming and it's okay to take a break. It's okay to mute people for a while or unfollow for a while. I wouldn't blame you. No one else should blame you. You have to take care of yourselves. We can't, again, we can't just go down with it that's not, then who's left to, to speak up for those people? Who's left to assist? It, it, ugh, it's overwhelming and I feel you. It, it's emotionally exhausting. So I encourage you to just take complete breaks or unfollow people as need be, or even like on Instagram and stuff like that, you can tell them like, I'm not interested in this kind of thing. And they'll know it, the tags and stuff, it'll slowly weed its way out. I do that on any kind of like hateful content or just content I'm not interested in, right? Like I don't really like dance challenges on TikTok, not my jam. I say, I want to see less of this. Guess what? haven't seen it since. So do that just to protect yourself because you're not alone in feeling like it's overwhelming and it's it's clearly dysregulating your system because you're feeling on edge and that's a trauma response. And I, I don't know if you have trauma in your past, but a big piece of me wonders if, you know, this is like re-traumatizing to you or triggering in a big way for you. Um, so it's okay to take breaks from it. Now, I guess... Oh, having fun and just relaxing. I know that this is not the brunt of your question. I feel like I just got into the brunt of your question. However, I think a lot of us struggle to allow ourselves to have fun and to relax. And I think it can come from a lot of different places. Number one, being a parentified child. If we never got to really be a kid, be goofy, have fun, relax, not stress about stuff, be lazy for a day, then it doesn't feel like it's appropriate or approved behavior. And we can grow up thinking that we don't get to be like that. That's for other people. We don't get that. Or we can be so like tightly wound slash type A, which I would call like, you know, so in fear of people not liking us and for us not fitting in and not being good enough that we can't relax. 
all of that pushes us to not only do inner child work, that's what I would say, if you think it comes from your childhood and being a parentified child, or even if you're type A, tightly wound stuff started as a kid, inner child work is going to be where I would encourage you to start. I have that a, a workshop available on my website, katiemorton.com. You can check it out there. I would head over there and look into that. So that's one potential opportunity. Another way that we can go about this, like having fun and relaxing, is setting aside some some time to to have like what I would call purposeful nothing, meaning don't have any plans, don't have anything, anybody that needs anything from you. And the goal of that day is to find something kind of joyful or fun filled. And I guess you could have some small plans. Like let's say you live in Southern California or in Florida and you're like, I'm going to take myself to Disneyland or Disney World. I never got to go as a kid and I always wanted to, or I'm finally going to go to that water park or I, I know we're getting into winter time, but you get what I'm saying finally do the thing that you wanted to do. I'm going to go to one of those trampoline places and jump around. I'm going to do laser tag. Do something childish and silly or have a day filled with nothing planned. I'm going to order food in. I'm going to lay on the couch. I'm going to watch my favorite show. I'm not going to watch the news. I'm going to watch like a show or a movie. Maybe you can plan that. I know it's been a lot lately, but we can also do things to regulate our nervous system first. Like I've talked about before, um, you know, shaking it out, dunking our head in cold water. It can also help for us first thing in the morning to get some sun on our face. There's a lot of ways that we can kind of take that edge off. If you have a cold plunge ability, like to get into one of those ice plunge things, I cannot tell you how many of my friends with anxiety or depression have told me how life-changing that is in the morning. Now, I don't know the research about it, but I'm just telling you that that could be another way for you to regulate your system and feel a little bit better because there are so many people hurting and that it can be so overwhelming to hear it and see it all the time. It does not make you a bad person for needing to take breaks from all the pain. So take those breaks. It's okay. I Unfortunately, it'll be there when you get back, but that doesn't mean you have to engage with it 24-7. That does not make you a bad person either. There's only so much pain each of us can handle every day. Okay. Let's move on to question number four. It says, hi, Katie, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about being a child born out of rape. I'm sure there are quite a few of us out there, but no one ever talks about the impact this has on our lives. I think I've known my entire life that I was the product of rape, but it didn't click with me until I was in my late 30s. The more I think about it, the more uneasy I feel. Half of my DNA is from a monster. I feel disgusted. I am adopted, abandoned at birth, so there's no one I can ask about my biological parents. Has there been any research done on children born from rape? Thanks. I'm so sorry you're going through this. And to be truthful, I wasn't sure how much research there was out there, but there is actually a lot. Everything from uh, the the NIH, the National Institute of Health, they have a qualitative study into the dimensions of interventions for mothers with children born of sexual violence. So essentially what we find is that because uh, we as children were born out of a traumatic experience, we know that trauma can affect us in the womb. When our mother is, you know, pregnant with us, if if she encounters anything that's, that's harmful or damaging or stressful or overwhelming, it can affect us. We're connected to her. Any extra cortisol or stress hormones in the system are going to affect us in our development. And we can, we find that children who are born out of traumatic experiences like that can also like essentially be more predisposed for PTSD and have PTSD symptoms as a young child, even though, you know, you could technically say, well, they haven't witnessed anything traumatic, but it happened to them and that was traumatic. Now I know that's not exactly what you're talking about, but they do talk about, um, so that's NIH. There's also, um, they talk about how victims, children who are born out of rape, often suffer from attachment difficulties and poor mental health. And that that can affect our educational outcomes. There's a ton of research. Um, I would just encourage you to look up on Google Scholar. I'll actually link a couple here. And there was actually this interesting article um, on the Center for Women's Justice.org. It's out of the UK. And it says an An evidence review commissioned by the Center for Women's Justice has found that children born as a result of rape are at risk of suffering serious and long-term harm due to the distressing circumstances of their birth from infancy well into later life. The publication of this report coincides with the launch of a policy briefing by the Center for Women's Justice urging the government to introduce Daisy's Law as part of an upcoming victim's bill. So there's a lot of stuff happening, a lot of research being done. 
a lot of talk about that was in 2022 just by the way so i will put some links to the research but it all in, overall what i learned in school what i've read in the past and what i looked up today to prepare for this podcast it sounds like there there is a correlation with being uh, born out of rape and struggling with mental health issues everything from attachment to uh, trauma responses to higher likelihood for addiction and not to mention the fact that you're adopted that comes with its own kind of you know attachment stuff so that's really what i know i wish there was more like i said i'll link some of the articles if you want to do a deeper dive and go into the articles that they cited that's the best way when i'm doing like a deep dive on something I'll read an article if I'm very interested in it. I'll look at who they cite and I'll click to the next articles. Google Scholar is great for that. But I found it very interesting, like all of this, you know, Daisy's Law. I was like, oh, interesting. Um, there's even a, um, you know, something on Wikipedia that talks about like this and um, everything from, like I said, the NIH uh, trauma and mental health report talks about children born out of rape, um, you know, can really s struggle and suffer from severe mental health issues. So, I know it's not positive stuff and I'm I'm so sorry, but at the very least it leads to like poor parent-child relationships. That's what one article had said that like, you know, the connection with the parent can be challenging. And so it's almost, you know, potentially better that you were adopted, but there's a lot to this and I feel like I can't do it justice in a short answer on a podcast, but I like I said I will link some of the articles. I encourage you to do some of your own research, read about it a little bit because my biggest encouragement after reading your question and reading some of the research is get support. Reach out. I hope, hope you're in therapy. If not, let's get into therapy. The more support we can have, the better, because just because we're predisposed for something does not mean it's going to happen to us. And it also does not mean it has to happen for our whole lives. The sooner we reach out, the sooner we get help, the better. Okay. So speak up, get some support. And there might even be support groups for stuff like this. I didn't see that online, but that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. We can look into it. If anybody knows of anything, put it in the comments down below. But you did not choose any of the things that happened to you. You are not the rapist. You didn't make this happen. You are an innocent victim. You're a child. And I know you're older now. You said it didn't click until your late 30s. But I just want you to challenge those negative thoughts, like I'm half monster or whatever, with the real facts. Sure, we can say DNA half monster. A lot of us can feel like some of our DNA is from bad people. A lot of us were abused or harmed by our parents or other members of our family. That doesn't make us bad. We didn't do this. We did not choose this. Let's focus on what we can change and what we can choose. And let's choose to feel better, to get some support because of all the research, and you'll read about it, it really shows that with proper support, it can get better. What they're talking about are people who haven't gotten any help. So let's focus on getting you some help, okay? Now let's move on to question number five. And this question says, hi, Katie, I hope you're well. I have a question. Why do I still feel like a young girl, even though I'm already 51? I don't understand it. It is so confusing. I have complex PTSD. Does that have anything to do with it? Kind regards. Thank you for everything you do. Of course, of course. Yes, it has everything to do with it. What When we feel like a young, younger version of ourselves, like we're 51 and we feel like we're a child, that's what we call developmentally arrested. Now, just think about that term, developmentally arrested. It means we're arrested or halted, stopped at a certain age. And developmentally, we still think we're that age. And we can act, even though we're a full-grown adult, we can act very childlike. I've had patients who talk baby talk to me. I've had patients who, um, for many years, would still prefer to wear diapers. Um, I've had uh, many patients who like to drink out of baby bottles, a lot of different things like that. So don't think that you're weird or that something's wrong with you. Unfortunately, when we're traumatized, that developmentally arrested experience can occur. And I find more often than not, my patients are developmentally, developmentally arrested at the age that the abuse started or sometime in there. Um, usually it's around that age. And until we process that trauma, until we but that could be a lot of different ways, right? We could do EMDR, we could do talk therapy, we could do schema therapy, we could do somatic experiencing through movement. However, we have to talk it out or move it out. The sooner we process it, the sooner we can let go of that child us and allow ourselves to grow and develop. 
that it could also be through inner child work. Like I said, I have that work, uh, the workshop available on my website, katiemorton.com. You can access it now. I also have tons of videos for free about inner child work. Check that out. That could help as well. The one thing I do want to mention and kind of not caution, but just allow space for is the fact that when we do process our trauma and we finally get ourselves to a place where we're feeling better and we're like, oh, I don't feel so stuck as this young girl. You have to allow yourself to grow and develop just like that young girl would have. Now, it will be more sped up because we are older, but it still takes time. I've had a lot of patients feel frustrated, like, why do I still feel so childlike? Why do I still do this part of it, but not that? Why can't I just, I want to just let you know ahead of time that it is. it will take time. Other people had tons of time to grow and develop. Give yourself the same opportunity. We're not expected to process trauma and then poof, be healed and we're back to a, you know, we're all better. Things will get better and it will be quicker, but it still takes time. And there will be stressful experiences when you want to revert back to acting like a young version of ourselves because that's a protective place to be. That's often, that's often why we're arrested to write when the abuse started because it's like we didn't feel safe to develop after that, right? And that time before was the only time we knew that before abuse occurred in our life. Does that make sense? Like we had, we had our life in a regular way and abuse hadn't tainted it yet. And so we sometimes like to live in that space too. So give yourself time to come out of it and test the waters of adulthood and of getting older and realizing that that's okay and at least neutral, but hopefully safe for us. Okay. So just be patient. It does get better. Final question, question number six says, hey, Katie, my therapist left her practice and I'll start therapy with a new therapist soon, but I don't know if I'll be able to trust her and I feel really lost. Is there anything I can do to be open towards her? I also ended the last session with being very angry at my therapist and I don't know what to do with that anger. I feel like she just abandoned me and doesn't care. I'm so sorry. I can't even think about her without getting angry anymore. Why does that happen? And what can I do to process these feelings? Because it almost feels like I hate her now. And before, I always felt very close to her. Therapy can be complicated. Having a therapist leave can be its own kind of wound. Now, a couple of things. I encourage you to talk to your new therapist about this experience, about being angry, about being upset. That's where I would start because that's where we're at right now. Now, I know you already had your last session with your therapist, but you can sign a release so that your new therapist can talk to your old therapist that can help save you time in the transition. And I would highly encourage you to do it. But that, those aren't your questions, okay? Your questions are, what can I do to be open towards her? Give yourself time. What helped you be open to your old therapist? Can we think back to that? Are we able to think about it? Or is it super triggering? My advice when it comes to a therapist is to slowly but surely share what's bugging you. What's bothering you today? Maybe it would help to write down some of the things you already worked on with your old therapist. What have you accomplished and what do you still have yet to get to? Let them know. You could write that down. You can talk to them about it. But slowly but surely, we'll start to feel more comfortable. We don't have to feel open and okay right away. Trust takes time and it's okay to take that time. Okay? So be patient with yourself. This is also a transition and it sounds like it was a rough one. Um, The anger for your therapist, I suspect and I don't know, but I suspect it could potentially come from a little bit of either attachment issues or splitting behavior, which yes, is part of BPD, but just because we use splitting behavior does not mean we have BPD, but splitting behavior is when we think people are all good or all bad and one slight or one harmful thing they did and we hate them. And that sounds like a little bit of what's happening here. We're doing black and white. We really felt close to them and now we're angry and we hate them. Um, And so I want to challenge that. Um, Anger is a secondary emotion. It means it's protecting you from what you really feel, which is probably hurt or abandonment. I want you to dig into this a little bit, you know, see if anything comes up from what I'm talking about and the questions that I'm asking. Can you dig into those types of responses? Do you, have you done splitting behavior before? Is this new? Do you, how do you really feel? Do you feel abandoned? Do you feel angry? Do you feel sad? Do you feel, uh, irritated? Do you feel exhausted? Maybe get the feelings wheel out and see what feelings, you know, attach or connect to you most closely. And then maybe consider, since angry is the big one, what is it protecting you from? What's the soft emotion that the anger's, you know, spines out for you? Think about it. 
because it's not that you're supposed to do anything with that anger. It's we're supposed to understand it. Anger is incredibly helpful. It tells us when we've been harmed or when we're under threat. So allow yourself to just be curious about it. And that curiosity will be the process that will help you process it through. A lot of times it's just us having these strong emotions and strong emotions can be uncomfortable, especially when we haven't had that kind of strong emotion about that person, right? So we get really uncomfortable with it. Oh, we hate it. We're angry. It feels like it's spinning spinning on itself, feels very out of control, can feel very weird. And if we try to stop it, it's only going to get worse. We have to acknowledge what it is and, and help it or not really help it, but allow it the time to tell us why it's there. And if we allow that anger the time to tell us why it's there, then we can understand where it's coming from. We can understand more about our experience. We can give ourselves some compassion, some love, some support, talk it through with our new therapist. And trust me when I tell you that it will go away. Feelings move through us. They don't hang around forever. They only hang around forever if we try to pretend they don't exist in the first place. So lean into your anger, figure out where it's coming from and what it's protecting you from. And there'll be a lot of helpful information in them. Okay. Thank you all so much for listening and watching. Please share this podcast. It really, really, really does help. I hope you're subscribed to this channel. And thank you for asking your questions on Sunday. Have a wonderful week. Do your homework. And I'll see you next time. Bye.